Good morning. morning. Welcome to the worship this morning. We are very happy that you uh, chose to come and worship with us this morning, and uh, thank you for, for coming. Today, we are, you'll see in your bulletin, is the anniversary of baptism, and there is an insert that's a list of folks that have been baptized um, in the last quarter. And so during that time, their parents and um, kids are invited to come forward for that um, uh, anniversary uh, part of our worship this morning. But let us open today with a prayer. Good and gracious God, we come today to worship you, to bring our heavy burdens and lay them down at the cross, to receive a meal of forgiveness, and to be strengthened and empowered for the service you call us to do throughout the week. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who died for us, who blessed us with this promise of grace that we live into today. In Jesus' name, amen. And with that, let us sing. Please stand. may be seated. I invite those that are celebrating the anniversary of their baptism and their parents to come forward if anyone is here. If not, we will just follow along. When God beloved claimed these beloved young people in holy baptism, he made sacred we made sacred promises parents promised and you can say this part to faithfully bring our children to worship to teach them the lord's prayer the creed and the ten commandments to place in their hands the holy scriptures and to provide for their instruction in the christian faith sponsors and this congregation promised to nurture them in the Christian faith 
and to support them and pray for them in their new life in Christ. So today we keep and renew our promises. That you may hear to the good news of Christ, the word of life. Parents, receive the sign of the cross on your ears. So I invite you to just touch your ears. That you may see the light of Christ illuminating your way. Receive the sign of the cross on your eyes. That you may sing the praise of Christ, the joy of the church. Receive the sign of the cross on your lips. That God may dwell within you by faith. Receive the sign of the cross on your heart. That you may bear the gentle yoke of Christ in serving. Receive the sign of the cross on your shoulders. That God's mercy may be known in your works. Receive the sign of the cross on your hands. That you may follow in the way of Christ. Receive the sign of the cross on your feet. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in, in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of, of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son our, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. dead. On the, the third day he rose again. again. He ascended into heaven. heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When you were baptized, an assisting minister handed your parents a candle, and maybe the candle that, well, you may be holding now, well, you're not, but you received a candle and said, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good work, works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are proud that you are part of God's family and workers with us in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the new life you give us through holy baptism. Especially we ask you to bless each of the young people on the anniversary of their baptism. Continue to strengthen them with the Holy Spirit and increase in them their gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who gives us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and forgives us all of our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. Take this time to share the peace with one another. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Please be seated at this time. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let us tell them what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock, I know not one. The word of the Lord. A reading from Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, when the weeds appeared as well, And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Good morning. Hey, come on up. So this morning we remembered our baptism at the early part of the service, and we, uh, I want to talk about family. See, in the reading from Romans today, it says something about 
adoption, being adopted into the family of God. And I have a question. How do, can you tell when someone, that someone is part of your family? How can people tell that someone's part of your family? How do you, how do you think? Yeah? I have a mom. You have a mom, yeah. And I have a mom and dad. A mom and dad, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're close to you. Yep. Sister. Sister, yeah. Yeah. Like You'll kind of look like each other, maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. You could have the same genes. Same genes, same blood. Well, one way that we know we're in family is that we're related by our blood, by our genes, like you said. Another way is sometimes we just claim people into our family, right? We say, you're like a sister to me so much, I'm calling you sister. You're a sister. You're a brother. You're one of the family. And that is what happens in our baptism. God claims us in God's family. But not only that, this whole congregation here, claims each one of you as part of this family. And so I'm going to have the congregation affirm that to you and say this. I'm going to have you say, you belong here, God claimed you, and you matter to us, okay? To these guys, all right? So they're saying this to you, okay? You belong here. God claimed you. You matter to us. I'm going to say that again. You belong here. God claimed you. You matter to us. And that's the whole message today. You matter. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, we love your family. Thank you for claiming us. And thank you for our family. Amen. Thanks. Have a seat. Well, some of you know, I grew up uh, in a, on a farm in Minnesota. And when I was growing up, one of my main jobs in the summer was to walk the bean fields. And if you don't know what walking beans is, it's a job where you, you have a hoe and you walk up and down the bean field, hoeing the weeds out of the field. So you're cleaning the field. And this was my job. And you quickly learned when you do this that not all weeds are alike, right? And not all weeds can be destroyed in the same way. It's been a while, but I do remember a few things. For instance, a cocklebur. It has a shallow but widespread root. And so it has to be pulled out so that you get the roots. If you chop it with the hoe, it'll come back a week later. However, a milkweed has a very uh, deep tap root that's very long, and it, you can't pull it out. I mean, you can try, but it's not going to come out. And it'll just, if you try just pulling it out, it will, it will branch out, and you'll have even more milkweed the next week. So with a milkweed, you have to take the hoe and chop it at its base and let the milk bleed out. And therefore, when the sap runs out, the plant is dead. Well, in addition to identifying the different uh, types of weeds and how to root them out, 
I learned that it can be tough to judge what exactly is a weed and what is a crop. Often the fields that I walked had been cornfields the year prior. And so now that it is a soybean field, there would be random corn stalks that would sprout up and grow, and these were now weeds. But last year, they were the good crop. But now this year, they're weeds. And it gave me concept that understanding weeds from the crop takes perspective. It takes seeing the bigger picture. And in our gospel today, Jesus knows his weeds. He knows his weeds well. The only instance of the Greek word zazanion is found in this uh, passage. And uh, that's a name for a type of ryegrass. Most likely, Matthew is referring to uh, something called darnel or cockle, uh, which was a noxious weed that closely resembled wheat. And it was very common in the Middle East. The difference between darnel and wheat, real wheat, is discovered once they've matured. Otherwise, you can't tell the difference between them. But once they've matured, real wheat will be heavy and droop, right? But darnel will stick straight up. And then you know, that's darnel, that's wheat. When Jesus explains the story of the weeds and the wheat, he identifies the meaning of every character except one. He identifies every character in that story, but he, but he doesn't identify one of them. So who does he identify? He says the sower is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seeds are the children of the kingdom, the weed is is the children of the evil one. The enemy who sowed the seed is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. But who are the servants? Who are the ones who question the master sower, the planter, about the quality of his choice of seeds? Who wants to root out and get rid of the problem right away? I think that the servants, maybe, are us. We, the listeners, who hear this parable and its explanation. For we are the ones asking, what's God thinking to allow evil in this world? We are the ones who want to get rid of the problems or those we deem problem makers. We are the ones who do more damage trying to do things our way than letting go and letting God. The parable, it has two significant points. One, it is difficult to judge between a weed and the wheat. And two, the roots and the wheat grow together. Pulling out one can damage the other, causing more problems than just letting them grow together. You see, bad stuff often looks like good stuff in the beginning. That's one of the differences between a real wheat field and God's field, the world. See, in a real wheat field, no matter what they look like while they're growing, a weed is a weed, and the weed is the wheat. It's just the way it is. But in God's field, the world, what looks like weeds today can be the crop tomorrow, can be the good seed. We can be a weed crowding out sucking dry, draining the nutrients and water. 
from the wheat, and then at harvest time, it can change. The weed can bring forth real fruit because with God, all things are possible and because people can change. So I think that's why I always kind of bristle at the language of children of the kingdom and children of the evil one. It bothers me because it sounds it sounds like their destinies are fixed. Matthew writes that angels will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin. And this was a Greek word, scandala. That they will collect all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire. Scandala, scandalon, it means stumbling block. And it's used a lot in Matthew. It's a word that repeats a lot in Matthew. And what it represents is a part of a person rather than the whole person. Carl Jung, psychologist, gave us modern language for this ancient term, scandala, or stumbling block. Carl Jung gave this thought the language of shadow, the shadow self. See, the shadow gets filled with all the things that we repress, all the things we don't want to identify with. And we think that by not looking at the trash in our lives, that somehow we've gotten rid of it. If we don't acknowledge it, if we don't look at it, if we don't deal with it, it just won't exist. But the opposite happens. These buried thoughts and feelings, they become the things that control us. They become the things that control us. So Jung believed that we needed to learn to deal with our trash. So instead of ignoring the darkest parts of ourselves and our neighbors and of our world and even of our church community, we heal by acknowledging the things we don't want to look at and know they are there. That way, we are actually better able to understand ourselves, to understand others, to show compassion. To, we are more capable of compassion by doing this for ourselves and for others. It actually lowers our judgmentalism. Isn't that amazing. And furthermore, we don't know how God is using us when we are stumbling around. In this book of Matthew, Matthew sixteen twenty three, Jesus says to Peter, right, the disciple he calls the rock, his rock. Right? He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block, a scandal on to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Peter makes a lot of mistakes. But Jesus doesn't give up on him. And if you were to look at Peter and some of the mistakes he made and things, choices he made, you would be quick to judge that he was a weed. And yet, Jesus believed in him and planted the future mission and ministry and the entire message of his church upon this stumbler. This is hope even for those who stumble or for stumbling blocks. In God's field, we have an opportunity for transformation. In God's field, we have an opportunity for new life, for weeds to become wheat, for enemies to become friends. 
And it is God who judges, not us. So, in the meantime, how do we live with the weeds, with all the mess? The parable is addressing another, uh, an age-old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world? Why does God let the weeds grow with the wheat? And it's difficult to make sense of God being good and loving and gracious. Of God hearing my prayers when I'm suffering or when my loved ones are suffering. When the world that God loves, for God so loves the world, is suffering. In Roman 8, Paul talks about this. Everything in creation is being more or less held back, he says. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. The difficult time of pain throughout the world are simply birth pains. Soren Kierkegaard is a philosopher, and he said that simply because one becomes a Christian does not mean that their lot changes, right? That a Christian will have to suffer exactly as he suffered before. But yet for a Christian, the heavy burden has become light. And what he's talking about is something we call the theology of the cross. And it means that we understand God as a suffering God and a suffering in the suffering of Christ. That is, rather than seeing God as somehow above your problems, watching us from a distance, a puppet master of sorts, controlling fates and disasters, we believe that God is amid the tragedy, suffering with us and for us sometimes. That God is present not because, not, not causing chaos, but entering into it with us. That God not only suffers with us, but works through us and through those dark, difficult times. Romans 8.26, which is the next line where our reading ended. It says, the moment you get tired in the waiting, God's spirit is right alongside helping us along. I missed that verse. <laughs> I wish you'd been in the reading this morning. The moment you get tired in the waiting, tired in the pains, God's spirit is right alongside helping us along. Because we live in a broken world, we mess up. But God is still good. God is still a God of grace and mercy and hope and love coming alongside, helping us along. So it's difficult to reconcile our questions about why God doesn't just step in and fix it all. When God just find the weeds and pull them out of the wheat. It's difficult because when what looks good and hopeful can turn painful and oppressive. But know that God is present and actively at work in your lives. Trust as we wait and hope with joyful anticipation deepening. And during this time of transition in the congregation of Messiah, from one long tenured pastorate to the new pastorates of the future, it may be tempting to say, well, we need someone exactly like or completely different than anything we know or know. But keeping in mind the lesson of the weeds and the wheat, how tough it is to judge whether what is good and bad is not bad and good. 
keeping in mind that for corn that is a crop one year can be a weed the next, don't miss the bigger picture in life. We start with who we are now. We recognize the shadows of our past and the good stuff. We celebrate the heritage that we've received because all those parts are part of the whole of who you are now or the holy now. And we celebrate and dream the hope of what we will be as the body of Christ in the world and in Springfield specifically. And whoever is fit for pastoral leadership will be a little similar to what you've known and a little different to what you've known, but will be the right seed for the crop. Amen. Called together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. Enliven your church with love for your world, O God. Give undivided hearts to Christians from Africa and the Americas, Asia and Europe. Make us one in faithful witness to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Renew the life of this earth, O God even as it groans because of misuse and decay. Cultivate in us an eager longing for a healthy and life-giving earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bridge the chasms that divide the nations, O God. 
inspire a reconciling vision among the world's leaders, and bring together people of different com- differing commitments for the sake of the world's most vulnerable people. Lord, in your mercy, embrace those who suffer, O God. Give peace to all who are near death, especially to those who are depressed, shelter to the homeless, and healing to the sick, especially Scott Franson, John Telfer and family, all, all, all fellows, Kathy Brooks, Paul Thompson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. embolden our witness to your love, O God. Send us out into the world with courageous hearts, persistence, and holy wisdom. Inspire us to tend and delight in our children's faith. Lord, in your mercy, Raise up your saints, O God. Inspire us, by the li- inspire us by the lives of all reformers and renewers of all your church, especially Brigidia of Sweden. Receive our thanks for the saints among us who have recently died. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up prayers of thanksgiving to the family and friends upon the birth and baptism of your newest of their newest granddaughter, Vivian Josephine Burglar, to Lisa and Carl Wesslin. And we pray prayers of sympathy for the Van Camp family and Nellie Seward's family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a sharing of gifts now. Merciful God, both our hand and said, The Lord be with you.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of Freedom, and let the Church say, Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The meal is prepared, and all are welcome who believe they are receiving this meal of forgiveness. The ushers will indicate when you can come forward, may either stand or kneel along the railing. You'll receive the bread, or, and then either a dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. Just let the server know which you would prefer. And if you need gluten-free elements, just let the server know we do have those as well. Come, let us eat. The meal is ready.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and gather you in his grace. Amen. Let us sing. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and this cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice, may we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. For our announcements today, I refer you to the messenger. Uh, there are a couple that are not in there, or that are, but I want to point out. Uh, tomorrow, Monday at 12 noon, the Lutheran World Relief Quilting and the Women's, after Lutheran World Relief Quilting, the Women's Circle Bible Study will be happening and bring a bag lunch and join the Bible study. Also, um, there is a, an announcement about Jean Schnaff's daughters are planning a garage sale at her home, and it says Friday, July 28th, but Friday is July 29th, and I think, I'm pretty sure it's Friday, so July 29th, not Thursday. And then after services today, uh, there will be Jenny Stilwell Jackson will be talking about Stephen's ministry, um, which is done at her church in Topeka and invite you to uh, please uh, listen to that and uh, learn about Stephen's ministry, which is something we would like to start here. And Wes, you have This is a great Sunday to have worship about the harvest. See, we have to share the harvest table that is important. All of us that have a reason our harvest is for the rest of the world and the I made a supper of the cherry tomatoes last night. It was very good. And now receive the benediction. May the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen.
take care. Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture.